you know what I love to do is just start with a little centering invocation where we oh, just take a few breaths in our heart and know that we've come together for divine purpose and so grateful for the convergence and for the opportunity and for the divine energies and entities that are seeking to amplify our capacity to touch people's hearts and minds in ways that are healing, catalytic, uplifting, so that other people, that light of entelechy, which is that internal impulse towards self-actualization, that that pilot light is strengthened and the courage to be oneself to the fullest is absolutely amplified through just the casual pleasure we take in each other's company and the ideas that come through us to look at from our different perspectives. <sighs> so I had a, a picture of the goddess Saraswati and my intention is, and I'm sure you have your own, expressed in your ways to embody the highest possible frequencies of infinite divine love intelligence, each in our own way and coming together to synergistically so that what pours forth from the three of us collectively is a gift we get to give to all your listeners and um, may it be fully activating of the highest and the best within themselves in their own creativity and their own way of being in the world. <sighs> huh, and so it is. Thank you. So what a it is. way to start this off. Yes, thank you. Oh, this is going to be fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the whole point. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Inspire Health Podcast. And we continue on with our series, our current series on the illusion of free choice, choice, returning to mastering your own life. And today we are really, really excited to have with us Laurel Erica. And we came across Laurel. Uh, I'll get into that story in just a little bit because this is a topic we've been wanting to specifically speak to somebody about and we've been looking for a while. And we first came up, I think we saw a... When we say a while, we mean about two months. <laughs> <laughs> well, two months specifically, yeah, where we've really like, we need to talk to someone that really understands words and the spells that we can put on ourselves. And so when we came across a video that you did, Laurel, and we just lit up and we're like, we need to get a hold of her right away. She would be a perfect addition to this series in covering this aspect. So today my guest is linguistic, evolutionary, and educational entertainer, Laurel Erica, the creator of Word Magic Global, wordplay that unravels mass hypnosis and elevates the frequency of consciousness. Laurel's Word Magic is a mind-bending, paradigm-shifting reintroduction to the English language that brings to light the hidden philosophy in puns, anagrams, and the symbols of the alphabet. By revealing some of the secret spells of the English language with which we write our own life sentences and sacred path words that point towards liberation, Laurel shows in verse and prose how young and old around the globe can collectively, creatively, and quite rapidly take command of the English language and upgrade it to facilitate our essential evolutionary leap from humankind to human kindness. Laurel, what an absolute honor to have you on the show today. Thank you. What a pleasure to sit with the two of you and the the cradle of love that you embody together that I feel so welcomed into and what a blessing. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I wanted to start this off by playing just a two, I think it's a two minute and 10 second clip directly from your website where it introduces Laurel Erica, because I read when I listened to that, um, it just, my whole body kind of lights up and I think it gives a nice introduction for people that aren't familiar with you and the work that you're doing and then we're going to dive right into it so i'm going to just pull up your website here 
So everybody, this is directly from Laurel's website, wordmagicglobal.com, under the section of Introducing Laurel Erica. And we highly recommend that you just sit back, stop what you're doing, and just enjoy <laughs> these play with, with words that Erica, Laurel Erica, is just so gifted with. Enjoy. Welcome. This is Laurel Erica. You're about to enter a world of words unlike any you may have learned in your schooling growing up. Here you will find ways of playing with words and with the symbols of the alphabet that the wise ancients of the East and West both practiced and encouraged to help people develop greater literacy, wit, and wisdom. Such an art has mostly been forgotten and dismissed as utter foolishness in contemporary Western culture. But don't you be fooled, for the keys to the kingdom are always hidden in plain view, and the world is put together word by word like a puzzle with the pieces too long hidden before minds that were conditioned not to notice. What I have found is that just by opening up words like oyster shells, we can discover pearls of wisdom with the powers to enrich us profoundly. Or we may uncover the seeds of our own destruction, which we've been scattering unwittingly through our casual conversations. And by so doing, we may actually be pronouncing life sentences upon ourselves and upon each other that diminish our capacity for joy and for entelechy, the actualization of our essential potential. So I invite you now to join with me in retuning and reinventing the English language to a finer, freer frequency so that we can parole our souls into a state of conscious liberation and life-enhancing recreation. As you explore through these pages, let what you find here remind you of your own umbilical pipeline to higher mind so that the divine wisdom, beauty, insight, love, and kindness natural to us all can flow through you spontaneously, both verbally and energetically, in ways that will delight your own heart and will enable us collectively to turn the tide on the global sea of consciousness. Laurel, I think that's just so beautiful and it, it, it opens up so much conversation. So like I was saying at the very beginning, we started to become more aware of words. You know, it's honestly something that I can't say I really paid attention to probably like the vast majority of listeners um, until it started to become, we were away for a while in, in Mexico and um, uh, some of the people that we were meeting there, the conversation around words really started to come up and we were actually taking a Spanish course and it was based in endolinguistics. So the idea of even origins of words and, and meaning behind words and how they've changed and this kind of stuff started to come up and it, it sparked a conversation just around like what's going on with words and and why do they have that these sort of weird sayings that sometimes we say you know we started thinking about why do we say good morning and why does you know that was one and the idea of like a weekend and some of these things that have these these weird undertones almost that started to just actually not feel in resonance anymore so i think Taya was even starting to switch good morning to grand rising a lot of times. And um, that would be how she would end emails and texts or just be speaking to people in person. And when I came across your work, I was like, that's exactly what we wanted to dive into. So thank you so much, Laurel, for being a part of the show today. Well, thank you so much for welcoming, so, welcoming me so beautifully and so lovingly. Happy to play with you. Yeah, so I think maybe at the beginning, um, you mentioned in the website and in the, in the introduction we just did, you said wordplay that unravels mass hypnosis and elevates the frequency of consciousness. That might be a really great place to start and a big question to open up with, but how do words play into mass hypnosis? And then on the flip side of that, how do we use them to facilitate consciousness? Well, words are the instrument of the hypnotist and the propagandist, and they do <laughs> induce sleep. 
and trust, especially when you haven't been educated. I read many years ago that a democracy requires an educated middle class. And I saw years ago a, a documentary about um, a conference convened by maybe Rockefeller about what happened, what went wrong in the 60s when all of a sudden women and minorities thought they ought to be able to have free will and determine their own destiny. And they decided that people had been overeducated for democracy and that they had to dumb it down. And the education that I got in grade school, elementary school, public school, relative to what my son got a generation later, it was a vast difference because there has been an intentional dumbing down. And there are many beautiful words that I discover synchronistically that uh, inspire a greater sense of human possibility. And those have basically been um, lost to posterity. They're no longer in the dictionary or they have been, the, the definition has been dumbed down. And one of my favorites is the word anamnesis, A-N-A-M-N-E-S-I-S, -S, which means the supposed recollection, I mean, the recollection of uh, knowledge from supposed past lives. So in other words, this soul has access to its whole history of evolutionary learning. And the more contemporary definition is a patient's recounting of their medical history. Oh, huh. mm -hmm. so, I mean, what, a, what an absurd uh, reduction. So words are manipulated constantly to shift people's perceptions. And most recently around, as we know, the whole COVID deal. So um, perception is everything. I saw a David Icke a little clip just the other day that popped up that said, um, uh, perception determines behavior. And the the word is the lens on the world. And so how we, how we speak becomes the lens through which we perceive it. So when you speak about good morning, um, most people come to my work for, through a video I posted in 2010 called The Secret Spells of the English Language. And because I haven't been very good at or interested in self-promotion, um, it had to grow on its own. And in the, or, you know, within five years, it had a little over 90,000 views. And then someone called me and told me it had 55,000 views. And I said, no, this is what it has. And she said, since I posted it on the Facebook page of Collective Evolution three hours ago. So people have heard that life sentence. Um, we awake each morning and go off during the weekdays to earn our living at various jobs and undertakings until we come to the weekend. And each one of those words can be taken apart to reveal its deeper meaning or its other meaning, let's say. So how can that not uh, affect us subliminally? It's a very dark vision of reality. And people who found it then wanted to know who did this to us. And certainly there's intention behind a lot of it. But I have also, all of my work is intuitive and speculative. And that was later confirmed by a lot of what I subsequently learned. And so my speculation is that words are not merely grammatical, they're hologrammatical. So there's echoes and reflections in our words of cultural consciousness, as well as higher consciousness. And somehow without sharing a common history, uh, words with the same resonance, because everything is electromagnetic vibration, migrate across continents, cultures, and centuries to come into the same um, sound and reflect upon each other when we put them side by side. And 
the easiest examples um, are P-R-A-Y and P-R-E-Y and Prophet Jesus or Muhammad and Prophet that's made on the birth, the supposed birthday of Jesus. And look at the word supposed. It's like so posed to be. It's posed as, I mean, we've only recently had to don masks, but we've been living in a masquerade forever. Everything is a false narrative for the most part. And I've looked at it in language. And there it's uh, Sherlock Holmes was said, um, what is it? The world is full of obvious things that nobody happens to notice. Mm -hmm. And with language, because there was such double talk coming at me from the people around me, um, I had to decipher it and uh, to know what jabberwocky they were speaking and where they were coming from. And that's what set me to doing it in the language. And I really believe and have evidence that um, I came in specifically to do this and started very, very early. So there's there are these words that, so that life sentence, we awake each morning, um, I wondered, well, where does that come from? And I realized that the when English was this molten flow of consciousness fed by many rivers, the dominant influence was the church. And the idea of a universe irreconcilably divided by conflicting male superpowers, one all good, one all evil, the fallen state of humanity and the misery of life, as well as the inferiority, is kind of written into the, no into the language uh, at the level of symbol and sound. And because we have been deafened by our definitions and taught to overlook the obvious, we we and and also to treat words that are related by sound but seemingly not of meaning meaning as inconsequential as um, what is the word coincidence and uh, which is a coincidence but which is dismissed as an insignificant convergence of seemingly disparate um, energies and ideas because we have been acculturated to ignore the obvious, we either overlook or underhear all the ways in which the word is echoing and reflecting us because English is and, and reality is like an echo chamber and a hall of mirrors. And there's constant reverberations of sound and sense with significant repercussions in how we perceive reality and therefore what we create in our lives. So, um, Sometimes I feel like I'm walking or talking on through a minefield and detonating subliminal explosions. And I have a maybe I, I posted the first page of something called um, uh, what is it? Proposing changes to our terms of agreement. And one of those terms is nervous system. How can you have a calm nervous system? <laughs> it's oxymoronical, which means it, it's completely con a contradiction in terms. Mm -hmm. But if we called it something else, like an electromagnetic highway in, uh, or system, and um, all of these terms can be tuned up to tune up the human instrument, our, our way of seeing and our way of being. And another one is, I mean, because I would hear it and I'd hear the oppression in it, the phrase atmosphere. To me, I hear at most fear huh. and people that the, the fear level, the frenzy of fear has been amplified so that we're under this heavy cloud, this at most fear of conflict and of animosity and of fear based antagonisms, when in fact we are all one being and we all have the same goal. 
which is to actualize our true potential uh, for sharing our gifts in the world, for being who we truly are, and for being seen and beheld um, with love and appreciation by other people. Because I'm convinced that we are a collective being. And the fact that right now I can see you and you can see me, but I can't see myself. We can't. We need that reflection. And only a part of our energy incarnates at any one time. And if you, uh, parts of you, the uniqueness of you is rejected, it's kind of like leaves, and that's what shamanic soul retrieval is about, to invite back more of the preciousness of who you deeply are as the infinite and finite form so it can activate itself and unfold its gifts. So that's kind of what I think about it. And of course, there's more to say about it. And words are simply hypnotic. And uh, Greg Braden has a wonderful piece on Gaia called Language and the Matrix, in which he says things about how our words wire up our brain and wire our access to the matrix. So we are, you talk about free will, uh, a friend, of, I don't know if he said it or I said it first, but that we don't have ideas, ideas have us. And we are their arms, their legs, and their mouthpieces. And when you don't have much education, but you have tricky wordplay in the form of memes that sound smart, uh, that you may not understand, but you'll give your life to defend. I mean, that's how effing insane it is. And individuality, our word, identity, which sounds sacrosanct, sacred, uh, our precious identity is almost identical to the word identical. <laughs> so this impulse to try and create beings with identical identities like ants under the command of a techno queen and monitored by drones, that's what's happening or that's what's being attempted to superimpose itself on our collective um, impulse to congregate as self-actualized beings into a super organism and create, you know, pool our common wealth for the healing, upliftment and transformation on the planet. And it seems to be, you know, efforts to preempt it into turning everyone like everyone else and um, uneducated and compliant with the will of the few endeavoring to control the many. Wow. Uh. <laughs> so friends who had no idea why we would be discussing language at this point for the series of the illusion of free choice, <laughs> I think that described it. I We couldn't have described it any better uh, than what you just offered. Here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank I mean, you. When you were talking about the nervous system earlier on um, in your wordplay, you spoke of the umbilical pipeline to the divine. And I wrote that down because I thought that was just so strikingly beautiful. And I think we could we could alternate the nervous system for we can just swap that out for the umbilical pipeline to the divine. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, well, what, what's interesting that you were saying, too, and even when you mentioned David, um, when we interviewed David, one, one David of the David who now David, David Ike, when oh, uh -huh. when you when you were mentioning that when we talked to him, he, he had also said one of the most mm -hmm. dangerous things that you can be is an individual, and, and dangerous, subversive. Yeah, dangerous to the system because mm -hmm. because when you're an individual, you you don't fit into the box anymore. You know, you can't be sort of um, you're unpredictable, right? Yeah. Um, and he said, that's the, that's probably the most important thing that we can all be is embrace our individuality again. Yes, absolutely. And, and it's a surprise package that we get to unwrap unless we had really awake, aware parents who recognized early, 
our divine impulses and did everything they could to support them and then get out of the way. <laughs> and a, um, a friend of mine is an expert at that. I highly recommend, especially homeschoolers, um, look at the websites of Risa Brown, R-E-S-A. You might want to interview her and I can connect you. Her two websites are the call to brilliance.com and passionorientededucation.com. And Risa helps children um, develop as they were meant to into the Renaissance geniuses we were all built to be. Most of us get uh, pretty crushed growing up and um, and can lose sight of what we came here to do. And it can be recovered and it will be recovered. And looking at my own life, because I certainly got steamrolled over, um, but I look at all the losses and um, all the of what I counted in the past as deprivations and realize that I got off scot-free because here I am now, <laughs> alive and uh, with a gift to offer, not only about words, but about human kindness. And that being the source of such exquisite pleasure and about what I believe is our greatest desire, which is to unfold fully that uh, essential potential that is our essence and true nature. And anything else is just counterfeit pleasure and distraction. <laughs> but especially right now, I, when the stakes are so high and the cosmic energies are so intensified to support our full evolution that we have been working toward over many lifetimes, that we get to fully flower in the, this world and beyond, contribute our scent and senses and our, our beauty and wisdom and discover it sometimes for ourselves. Certainly I am in a constant process of discovering, you know, look at what I thought I was and who I really am. It's a huge contrast. And uh, anyway. No, it's, it's, um, it's so fitting. I mean, we were, we've have a, a five and a six year old and and an 18 year old and an 18 year old as of yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> so it's all over the map, but, um, the five and six year old, we have chosen to kind of take them out of the regular system and they're in a forest school. And we, we sat with this and we were just having this conversation yesterday around, and it's getting out of the, it's, it's, it's really doing the best we can to, to not create our own judgments around what we think is absolutely right or wrong. But I think being really clear with what's what really resonates with us at certain times and and following our own truth around that. And so we had a conversation around in regards to parenting for our kids. What is really the most important thing at this point for us that we would want to be able to assist them with and provide for them? And as um, far as an education, as far as an education came and um, Ultimately, for us, it was the idea, we really want them to have a very grounded, solid sense of self, like mm -hmm. from the grander purpose, because then from that place, you know, and I know some people say, well, you're, you're keeping them away from the reality of the world. And these are saying, like, I'm like, you know what, that's good, because they don't need all of that. They need to first have a solid, grounded sense of who they are, so that when all of this, I would say, chaos and confusion comes they've got such a strong sense of self that they they can separate it rather than become all confused inside and then not sure what to do and then ultimately outsource it to someone else to tell them who they are which is what normally happens mm -hmm. yeah yeah well bravo for you i'm so happy for you and i have several quotes that i'm fond of sharing one being from the um poet well, his name is escaping me at the moment, German, American, depressed, Charles Bukowski, um, who said, most everyone is born a genius and buried an idiot. <laughs> and, 
One of the life sentences I've called the secret spells of the English language, we awake each morning, our premier life sentence, but it really isn't. It's just a neater package to put together than the one I have for children, which is how it starts out. Uh, first of all, they, they, they newly arrive and they're referred to as the new arrival and they're looked upon as a rival sometimes by the other partner in the marriage as well as by the children. So already there's a word of conflict in it. And then they hear throughout the day, time to change the baby instead of time to change the diapers. Uh, yeah. And I mean, what a condemnation that is. And then uh, they go to school to learn lessons and no growing thing wants anything that lessens their, their time for exploration on their own and then support of that. And their lessons, they are taught in school and taught uh, T-A-U-T means tense and tension is a cause of of nearsightedness. And I years ago did research to write an article on natural vision correction therapies. And one of the things I read is that, as I recall from how many years ago, I don't know, um, that only about, was it 10% or less are born with vision impairments and about 60% need glasses by adolescence. And the need for glasses follows a traumatic event by something like 12 to 18 months. And the type of correction needed depends on the type of compensation they've developed to protect them from whatever the trauma happened to be. And people with different personalities need different correction lenses for their different person, uh, personalities. And as Dr. Joe Dispenza says frequently, um, your personality creates your personal reality. So when you break the habit of being yourself, you open for a whole reset with higher frequency energies to move through this system and put everything into harmony again. So um, bravo for you for taking them out of school. And oh, just to finish that life sentence, uh, many children don't want to be a grown up. And who wants to be a grown up? It already sounds like pain. Mm -hmm. um, their natural essence, the natural essence that you are protecting through the kind of education you're giving your young children um, protects them when they move through that, that transition period that we've termed adolescence, which sounds like adult essence, when you're so overrun by hormones and by the influence of your peers and now by all of the um, technology and the games and stuff that you lose sense of your essence mm -hmm. and um, after being completely addled. And then finally you arrive and become a fully fledged adult. And adult is another word for idiot. And you get to celebrate on your 21st birthday by uh, indulging in spirits now that you are so divorced from your own natural connection to spirit, your umbilical connection to the divine. So what a life, what a process. And it takes people going counter current as you are and as I endeavor to do to be able, especially at this time, to wade through the riptides and um, calling forth the uh, guides and angels who work with us to support us because they are seeking fulfillment in, through, and as us and with us, not taking us over, not us channeling them, but a collective enterprise to bring forth the, the, the greater, I, I just wrote a blog this morning that I'll post after I've had a chance to review it, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I love it when you 
just a, a divine idea just drops in on you and you get to play with it. It's so much fun. And then it's catalytic and enjoyable for others. And then they do the same thing. They just open to allow their innate genius to uh, flow through. And um, that sort of censoring um, robocall that plays through everybody's mind, the, the mind chatter and my little, my quick little poem for myself years ago was, We've a cellular line to the divine, but ego causes static. As we each let go and enjoy the flow, our lives become ecstatic. Mm. <laughs> Beautiful. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm wondering if it's possible for friends who haven't um, heard Life Sentence yet, if you would mind reciting it for us. I, I would be happy to. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, this is a sentence that I put together. Gosh, I don't know if it was before the 1990s. Uh, I, um, and it goes this way. We awake each morning and go off through the weekdays to earn our living at various jobs and undertakings until we come to the weekend. And all people agree that that's the normal way of things. Only more people die of heart failure between 6 and 10 a.m. Monday morning than any other time of the week. So, and, and this is something I've heard from various medical people, starting with Deepak Chopra. And so when you translate that life sentence, which is something that I like to do, I translate English and I spell it T-R-A-N-C-E with the idea that words cast spells. They are our lens on the world. And when you translate that, you remember that awake is also a funeral party for the dead where you celebrate the dead. Mourning is the state you're in when you attend awake. So when we say to each other, good morning, on a subliminal level, we're saying good grief. We would have to be staggering around through the week in a week days to earn our living since urns are vases for the ashes of the dead. We call our jobs undertakings. Job itself is a Hebrew word for persecuted, as in Job. And what we get at the end of this perverse bargain with life is perver uh, pr uh, progressively weakened. And when we wish each other have a great weekend, I mean, we get the weekend of this bargain where we sell our time and labor for someone else's enrichment just to be able to survive uh, minimally. And so have a good weekend instead of have a good strength end. And um, I found it amusing that uh, many people in Britain describe a 10-year period of time as a decade rather than a decade. And so I don't know if I remember. Well, I will just try it. At first, I suspected the hand of illusion, entangling the language to foster illusion. And I think it's quite true that a culture's theology has a great deal to do with the word's etymology and how it evolves over time to combine incompatible meanings that may undermine the original thoughts it was meant to define. But now I don't think it's all planned for the thing that I've found is that like concepts can gravitate toward the same sound and vibrate at the rate that our thoughts designate because words are electromagnetic vibrations whose fine alphabetic tintinabulations can take on the tint of our true expectations, which they then imprint on our metal of mind, causing sounds to adhere when they're of the same kind. So that's basically what I believe. I think it happens magnetically in large part to reflect the dominant cultural in, uh, dominant cultural imprint. Mm. Mm. You know, it, I, we were just talking to um, uh, Jonathan and Andy Goldman, who are in the world of of sound and sound healing and musicians for a long time and i'm gonna 
carry on this conversation, I think in another series with them, but around the idea of harmonics. And he was kind of talking about a lot of times, even with harmonics, you don't, you don't even have to do anything, just sitting and hearing things, it's having an effect on your body. And it, it, it resonates with me in the way that you are speaking about this. And a lot of this stuff just goes on. And without you having to even be conscious of it, it's just having, you know, an electromagnetic effect. Like there's so many overlaps with this. Like when I think about even when we talk about things like electromagnetic frequencies, right? And there's a lot of, you know, what we're perceived, it's very much in the similar way. What we perceive through the five senses is this small little bandwidth, yet the, the greater reality it's is massive and all of that is still coming through and affecting us even though we're only perceiving a small amount that we call our perceived reality there's all these other things that are influencing it and when we talk about electromagnetic fields often in the electromagnetic field there's the first wave that we talk about as the electromagnetic field that's creating this effect but what's rippling off of that like a boat going through the water are these compression waves that are having this secondary effect and that's what we actually call electro smog. It's this build up and build up that's taking place. I feel like we are literally in this word smog that's been going on for so long and that we are we are now if we can see it and then actively choose to do something differently. I think that's kind of the best I, to the same as what I feel like we're trying to do with with electro smog and, and EMF pollution and all these different things. Yes. You know, once there's an awareness to it, then we can do something with it. Yes. Yeah. It, it is exactly coming to awareness. Um, just wondering whether that, like that opening stanza of my piece, first person singular that goes, this life is like a shadow play, the flickering of night and day through which illusions in our minds are manifest and intertwined into a web that few evade, though they see through the masquerade. So the fact that think and thing is just the final letter that's different between them. And we jump from think to thing, never thinking anything of the weird phantasms we are conjuring together. So yeah, it is it is pollution. It's language pollution, it's consciousness pollution. And um, gosh, many maybe 12 years ago or so, I had a dream in which I was listening to a very advanced linguist. And he said that when we upgrade English, that the new beings coming in won't have to forget who they are or why they're here. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and that that's the ultimate purpose of my work, it recognizing that language is software. And I have to confess, I don't listen to my podcasts. So I don't, and that's not bragging that's lazy and um so i want to share something that's just fun first of all i want to talk about life stream we're on the light row gently and merrily down the stream life is but a dream and life stream and life's dream are the same and i think the reason that it was that so-called heresy, not buying into the dominant cultural narrative, <laughs> which we have a resurgence of these days. Um, in the time of the church, it was punishable by horrible torture and, and brutal end of life. I mean, brutal murder. It's just, and I think it's because our collective mental energy, they want it all focused on the same paradigm so they can manifest it into the life stream. Because you don't hear a difference between life stream and life stream because there really isn't. Mm -hmm. I think we are conjuring together this nightmarish reality by buying into it. And so much of that happens through words because the word is the lens on the world and now cognitive science is finally proving it um, but we've known it forever and you may have another question I sometimes 
can go on too long. So I ask that you interject yourself before I get started again on another tangent. But what I was going to, the tangent I was going to take had to do with a vision statement that I then turned in and at the end to a piece of verse that maybe you've heard on some other podcasts and forgive me for my redundancy. Um, but that that was the first little piece. So in all our efforts to heal our psyches and raise consciousness on the planet, we have all but overlooked the very instrument of conscious thought and communication. Yet our forked tongue English language, which is the leading software of the Western mind, is itself in great need of retuning and upgrading. Over the course of my life, I have cultivated a heightened sensitivity to how the total normality of insanity in, in, in society is echoed, reflected, and reinforced by the English language, which inadvertently yet unavoidably propagates the antiquated and manipulated vision of reality promulgated by the church as an instrument of mind control at a time when people had to surrender their minds if they wanted to take, keep their heads about them quite literally. So if we elect collectively to upgrade the English language to a higher frequency, through our linguistic creativity and our naturally occurring verbal eccentricity, then ultimately, even clatter from our idle chatter, prattle patter, blabber blather and palaver as we jabber gab in Babylon, will turn our glowing terms from verbal vapor, either hanging in the air or trapped on paper, into tiny bits of shiny matter as we gather, chat, and natter on and with new skill at trilling, thrilling statements that instill fulfilling imagery of higher possibilities, will finally still the quiet riot of the wild child's manic panic through the mind so we can flip the switch, enlightening every circuit of our consciousness with the electric surge of verbiage that encourages superb and selfless services to spread from soul to soul around the globe by what is said in all the light years up ahead. And then, from the islands of silence between all that's spoken, we will listen as doors to the heartland spring open. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Laurel, is it just in the English language? Or do you find these these same you know, sorts of... If I knew more languages, I would find them, but they are found in all languages. Um, and I once met, amazing synchronicity, I met a woman who told me she knows six, she has at her command 67 languages, 52 of them dead languages. And she actually was interested in what I do with words. And somewhere I have a quote from... I'm not sure whom, but he said um, something like the differences between languages is a singular way of making puns. So it's whatever is in the cultural consciousness that has coalesced into the same sound. So I, I met someone maybe from Sweden and so Swedish people may tell me I'm completely wrong because it's been a while, but that the word gift, which did not mean what it means in English, meant marriage and prison. And someone, I think from Germany, said the sound for the word for shame was the same sound for pubic hair. <laughs> so these are echoes and reflections of cultural consciousness and uh, and and then there are the sacred path words, which I haven't shared nearly to the extent of the secret path of the secret spells. But boy, that's where the wisdom comes from. Like, uh, well, 
um, I've written things for children. They just, I just haven't published them. And I need more of my own time to be able to complete many projects. And uh, for a living, I have been, uh, I, I have classes online and I've also edited for thought leaders and it's wonderful, but I feel like I'm being crowded out of my own life. And um, I'd like to complete many pieces, but um, just start by asking your children, um, what do you think is the significance of the fact that the word earth is the same as the word, word heart? It's just where you happen to place the letter H. So what, what might be, uh, what would you interpret from that coincidence? And I believe you will get some very interesting answers and none of them are wrong. They're all right answers. And the first child I asked, probably seven said, maybe it means that the earth is the heart of the solar system. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons I say that word magic turns youngsters into punsters mm -hmm. and punsters into pundits in the ancient uh, Indian meaning of a pandit, a wise commentator. So there is wisdom in everyone. And I made a note when we began about uh, an article I read years ago in the New Yorker about the father of Louisa May Alcott. His name was Bronson Alcott. And he was a friend of Emerson and Thoreau, and they looked to him as a, a mentor. And he had schools where he was drawing forth. People say, well, education means to draw forth. Well, but who's doing that? Mm -hmm. And Bronson Alcott was doing that back in the 1800s, knowing that the these are um, divine beings in human form at the beginning of a new lifetime, and they come carrying gifts and wisdom, and he had ways of drawing it forth from them. So if you were to go online and Google Orpheus at the Plow, if you want to see it, New Yorker magazine, that's where you would find it. So beautiful. Um... I was just, we were just actually having this conversation, I think every day actually we've been talking about this subject because it's at the forefront of our mind right now. And as far as children and schooling and education and what's really important um, and as far as how we are needed to support them as caregivers and parents. And um, what, what came up is that, you know, there's this emphasis on you know, how can you not put your children in the regular school system? What if, you know, they'll be missing out on, you know, typical things that people go to right away is the socialization. Um, Cause we didn't have our children in, in any form of school until a few years, um, at least a couple of years later than most children do. And the other thing is, you know, they, they need to learn certain skills and they need to be up to date with the curriculum and we didn't think that was the case at all and what we were having the conversation of specifically i think it was yesterday is that you know that kind of thinking or thought stems from the place that children come in knowing nothing that is valuable so then it is our job to actually bring to them things of value so that they will actually be worthy uh, among members of society as they get older. And we don't, we don't agree with that at all. We, like yourself, believe that children come in from a higher realm knowing exactly what they're coming in to do. And it is, it's been my observation on an intimate level with my now 18-year-old son seeing him wither <laughs> with each year of schooling and and feeling at that time helpless about it and thankfully um now jason and i are absolutely on the same page so we're choosing to do something completely different with our five and six year old but 
you if you if we're sensitive to our children's needs and who they really are on a day to day basis, because they come in with their own personalities, they come in with their own gifts. And it is, you know, once you have multiple children as well, and they don't have to be your own, you can just go and observe as an auntie or an aunt or a friend. When you're observing children, you can see that they come in knowing who they are. And it is only through um, the, the, the programming or the enforcing of our ideas as parents onto children that we start to alter who they are or we let them lose sight of who they are. And so we don't wanna do that as parents. And we're actually going to be actively sharing um, our experience with that and the, the information and the people and the wonderful ideas are some, are some others. And ultimately, I, I feel like when, when those nuggets of ideas come in that are really impactful, those are not even ours, those are, the the divine ideas that are working them, themselves through all of us if we're just open and receptive to them but we'll be sharing more and more of that through our sister platform which is aij adventures and joy which is more the experiential sense of what it is that we're actually implementing within our lives that we speak of um, with wonderful guests like yourself so Thank you for for highlighting that because um, it's really important how we show up for our children. Absolutely essential and how blessed they are to have you so aware and so supportive. I mean, it's like each one is a seed. You don't yet know the nature of the plant, yeah. but you give it the best soil and nourishment and and stand back and behold. So... Yeah, how wonderful that you are doing that. It's such an interesting, when we were just reflecting on it, is the idea of it's like, I mean, a lot of times it comes from the parent, from a very you know, noble sort of place of wanting to educate them on what they think is important. But it's it's interesting because it's it constantly keeps, some of it's the same and it constantly keeps changing. <laughs> it's like whatever was deemed as being important to teach them at a certain generation, you know, that's what you want to teach them. Then you kind of find out later that, oh, maybe that wasn't very good. And now, now we're going to, now this is right. Now this is what we need to teach them. Then you find out a little bit later down, oh, maybe that wasn't so great either. So it's just this ongoing process of, of, of the adults thinking that they know what is most important to teach their kids and then realizing down the road, it's like science. It's, it's like everything in science at some points usually gets debunked as you learn more information that it wasn't actually as beneficial as you thought it was. Um, and that's the whole nature. It should be through observation. Um, I think it's just sort of an idea that maybe kids come in with um, their own sense of who they are, what they're here to do. And if you can just create an environment that allows that to be fostered, then let's see what happens and protect them and support them and, and give them opportunities. But don't uh, try not to stifle things and try not to think that what they're doing is the wrong way if it's different than how we're doing it. Um, I still have to catch myself on that because, you know, there's there's all this stuff that's been ideas of what we think is the right way and the wrong way to do things. And more and more, we keep trying to catch when we're getting caught in old sort of patterns of, of judgment or rights or wrongs and, and create more of an openness and space to allow for something different to evolve. Yes, that's beautiful. Well, it makes me think, Laurel, like where within the, the word play and, and language, where is it of most benefit for people to, to sort of start a process to to help to to be able to utilize words in a way that actually fosters a shift in consciousness where does the average person even begin that process well um the first thing i would say is the awareness that um everything in life we do is about the feeling we want to have as a result of doing it and the feeling we get through loving kindness stimulates the same part of the brain as cocaine. So if loving kindness 
um, becomes an overriding intention, even when you're not always feeling that way. And when you're not, you know, you allow yourself a safe way of venting the anger, the hurt, the upset, whatever it is. But that's just defensive reaction to an unfortunate experience. What is our true nature as you watch children is creativity and fun and resilience, quick recovery and, um, and lovingness. So that's our nature and we get tricked and conditioned out of it. So if you recognize that being loving is where you get the best feelings and then our love of beauty that we have, I was just in Beverly Hills, looking uh, in the windows and these photographs of models and celebrities with these faces that are beyond perfection and beauty in that physical way. And just, I don't know, the responsibility it takes to be so extraordinary and then feel like you have to maintain it. And I once saw a photograph on my newsfeed um, on my phone, it was uh, a dark skinned couple. And I couldn't tell if she was a blow up doll, or a sex doll, or if this was a human being who had been heavily plasticized. And I had to keep enlarging the picture. And I thought, what pain and what expense for the desperate hunger to be for your beauty to be perceived and for you to receive love for who you are. Mm -hmm. So when it's all externalized, it gets completely insane. So if in speaking, like, I have a really beautiful poem. I don't even know if I know the whole thing by heart. And I don't really feel like I want to go into it at the moment. But it's called Open Heart Synchrony. And it's a vision of what will happen when we tune up English collectively so that um, like the opening is, I think of how exquisite it will be when we endeavor together to create an enchanting living language of supernatural harmony that scintillates so sensually that everything around us begins to vibrate sympathetically. Our words will ring so true that our honest expressions initiate lyrical sensations that every creature can appreciate since we are all interconnected genetically and electromagnetically. So just as bird songs, cricket choirs, and other natural voices evoke a wholesome rhythm and nourishing harmonic for the planet, our gentle elemental language, every time it is spoke, will resonate symphonically with earth and all upon it. And then when we give our word, if it can't be broken, we shall spin gold every time it is spoken. This may sound absurd, but let no one scoff it. For when truth be told, it shall make us profit. So then further on, on page two, that's maybe the first half of page one. Page two says, if our words so melt the heart, they start the melt of human kindness flowing so that every time we speak our mind, we set another flower growing. Then I believe before our very eyes, we human beings like butterflies will fully metamorphosize. And that's what we're seeking to do for an irreversible alchemical metamorphosis so that we truly become, as Dr. Joe Dispenza describes it, we become supernatural. And I think it's so obvious in that the word infinite is composed of infinite. It locates itself as in 
everything. And we therefore have the capacity to download more of our supernatural capacities. And as we do, as we speak, flowers grow, <laughs> hearts open, kindness spreads. So um, I have an anthem called Speaking Beauty, um, an anthem for our era, which I don't need to share now unless it comes up for me to do so. Um, but it, that's the point. Speak beauty with the intention of loving kindness. And, um, and when you're not feeling that way, I mean, that's because of all the static on the line, all that noise. And so do something to find peace inside your own heart. And there's more and more modalities, easy to implement uh, right there on the spot so that the static dies down, the mind quiets, the heart opens, and then the desire to speak beauty in ways that touch hearts and treat them as the golden treasure each one naturally is, cheapers. I mean, talk about good feelings. <laughs> so that's what I would suggest. I, that's beautiful, Laurel. Mm -hmm. Even when we were talking to the Goldmans the other day, and they were even suggesting later later on in the interview, they were talking about just as we were talking about the, the power of sort of um, musics and music and frequency and harmonics and whatnot. And he was saying, even just in your spoken word, have that feeling of loving kindness coming through in the words. And that in itself will, because we talked about how frequency plus intent equals healing. So the idea of the, the, the sound being a carrier wave for the intent. And if you can have that intent back there somewhere um, of loving kindness and in everything you do, you're imbuing the world with that, with that beauty. So uh, I think that's wonderful. You also said something that I, in one of the other, one of the other, I think it was actually in the truth seeker I think it was in there. You said, when we let go of our againstness, we yep. step into our immenseness. I think that's a really, really important perspective, Especially particularly now. now, because what happens is there's so much stuff that creates division and then it gets pulled over here and then people have to fight against this to try and get it somewhere else. And then something else inevitably comes up and then we go against this and it's it's the same idea I think I talked about earlier around really trying to catch our judging around things. You can have you can have things that you resonate more with, but that's a different feeling than againstness. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about that because I, I think that's such an important aspect right at this at this time. Well, um, as you were saying againstness, I was seeing again, again and again and again. Uh -huh. And again, is if you separate the A from the rest, it's a gain. So people think there's something to gain by proving their point. But often it's like trying to uh, penetrate a, a brick wall. Why would you expend so much energy except you're looking to discharge anger and rage and hurt and upset but as you say it can just go on and on and on and on and so interesting that you brought up truth seeker because it was um, for him that I wrote that um, speaking beauty and that anthem for our era, which talks about when we let go of our againstness, we step into our immenseness. So, um, yeah, conflict. And here's interesting in terms of words, at least to me, um, the word apart. Do you want, one of you want to just define that word? <laughs> apart is like separation uh -huh. as opposed to a part um, yeah, it's both, isn't it? Yeah. And the irony is when it's two words, it means a part of. When it's one word, it means apart from. Mm -hmm. So there's, it just turns out that way that the language is all sorts of crisscrossed 
messages and, and, and what that must do to the brain. I recommend everybody watch that Gaia presentation by Greg Braden on language and the matrix. He gives the science between what I've been saying for a very long time. And I, my understand, he recognizes the need for uh, the evolution of language, as did Confucius and Orwell and McKenna and Gary Zukov and many, many others. Um, and I think from my understanding of what I've heard him say, he's kind of thinking that these as yet untrans uh, untranslated scripts in something like 23 ancient scripts, that one of them might be a language of wholeness. Um, but I say, why wait? And you can't simply impose a language, you know, now speak this way, which is hardly <laughs> promoting um, for, you know, a unity consciousness. Um, but let's creatively collect it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, connect it <laughs> collectively, <laughs> wiring up our brains differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have anything? No, I don't think so. Oh, what do I want to say next? Um, this is this has been absolutely lovely, Laurel. I'm so enjoying this. Um, where did I make a note here? Right when, kind of tying back to the concept of againstness, and you're saying again and again, it it again makes me think of the concept um, of resonance. It's like wherever you are putting your focus on you are putting yourself in resonance with that. So if you are accepting or rejecting something, you're putting yourself in resonance with it. So in a lot of times we will hold ourselves in resonance with something that we're actually fighting against, so to speak, but we're constantly staying in it because we our focus is on that forever and ever and ever, again, again and again and again. So I, I think the more we can, we can work with letting go of these strong feelings of of againstness and and judgment tied to things and and really just try to pay attention to what's in resonance you mentioned around feeling or even allow it to be even a catalyst to yeah. do something different what is it that you're what is it that 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 is pointing to what is it that you wholeheartedly desire what kind of an yeah. upbringing how do you want to raise your child what sort of a world do you want to create for yourself and everyone else to live in so see it as a catalyst rather than needing yeah. to fight against it or or it's continue a, it yeah it's like the contrast that helps you redefine the direction that you're wanting to move in and right. that's really why we're having these conversations so that it'll plant seeds and allow people to think twice about the words that they use on a daily basis or what is fueled with or what the intention behind that word is and and how they want to possibly choose differently like you know simple thing like grand rising as opposed to good morning if that resonates with you or something different something that you make it up yourself yeah. i think it's it's mm -hmm. fun it's when you put in the play right um i mean kids will our kids will make up stuff or say different words that aren't words that we use but it's like oh, that's a great it's <laughs> like it's fun it's playful and when you'd mention around feeling probably a, a good place for all of us to pay attention to is when we are saying mm -hmm. things if we can have that pause to even reflect on how does that actually make me feel or, or you know or myself i've even been checking like you know, there's also so many things, particularly the, over the past couple of years, that are standard statements that everybody puts as taglines on the end of their emails. And it's like, how does it make you feel when you say it? Like, I'll give you an example. Stay safe. Mm -hmm. Especially in Canada. because it, the... it doesn't make me feel good when I hear that. So I don't say that because it kind of in, implies that there's something dangerous that we need to stay safe from. Yeah. So, so which if, if that really resonates with someone, then go for it. But if it doesn't, I'm just saying, check in with yourself around how words make you feel. And if it doesn't feel so great, or if it doesn't resonate, find play with them, find another way to say things that maybe is more you rather than just what we're sort of what's normal is not always optimal. I often say that when it comes to healthcare, it's like normal does not mean optimal. They're very different. So it's like bring more of you into the world. The world needs more of you. I remember writing a um, a graduation um, 
sort of letter to my to my nephew who just graduated a little while ago and one of the things in there was around this concept of really being you you know finding your own voice finding who you are the world needs more of you needs more Braden than it needs of, of anybody else's idea of what Braden should be for example so i think anytime we can bring more of ourself into this world um, that's a beneficial thing well i completely agree and I just want to back up in terms of it's in resonance, even if it's in conflict. Well, we might say it's in residence, Robin, <laughs> <laughs> if we think of resonance as harmony. So yes. it's it's in a relationship. They're housed under the same roof, but uh, that might not be a happy place. <laughs> um, in terms of judgment, I mean, I find my the mind judging a lot, and it's like... I, I, mostly I can blow it off. And those that I have taken seriously and judged, I mean, it's inevitable that I will turn around and see myself doing the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, you it's just uh, an echo. It's so quick. Um, when you were talking about you, um, because you, I mean, I guess it meant more uh, had more impact when people were living on the land because a, a you is a female sheep. So th the idea that you are you um, and sheep can be so easily led to slaughter, whether they're holding the knife or under the knife. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, so this is a language of conquerors, of competition, of conflict and mediocrity. And um and a lot of wisdom and truth and it it is the uh, i understand from william henry a mythologist who wrote the book the language of the birds that english is angelish it's the language of the birds and i know we can upgrade it so that we are in harmony with nature as we speak and write and it's a collective endeavor and the intention behind it needs to be about promoting beauty, healing, and upliftment. And at the same time that I posted the video that ultimately, I don't went, I don't know what to call it, not viral, certainly, spiral maybe, or whatever. <laughs> but at the same time, I posted my word magic anthem, which is called Taking Command of the English Language. And I think it's a really nice piece. And I kept asking the person who had posted the secret spells, please post this one. But it never got the same level of attention. And there's attention, you know, who wants attention? And yet everyone wants attention. I mean, there, there our nervous system gets all uh, involved. So... Um, it's about that wonderful, well, it uses as an example, the wonderful phrase, um, uh, something like commit random acts of kindness and acts of senseless beauty. And I looked it up once on the internet and it said that it, well, you know, it was something that came to a woman in a restaurant in Sausalito and she wrote it on a napkin and it went all over the world and transformed behavior widely. And it's still resonates it still has impact and as i say in that piece to be the one to release the dove of peace on a wave of love that lifts us all above our usual sense of separation must surely be the cause for an ongoing celebration for it is certainly an experience that lifts us well above words and beyond anything money could possibly buy and yet it is free for all who wish to glorify God's living presence as our human essence and thus to bless the best in the rest of us. But speaking of money, have you heard the exhilarating word tourbillion? It means something resembling a whirlwind or a firework that rises spirally. Ideally, we all could be tour billionaires with worlds of words that swirl the world's next revolution. 
And with a zillion, vermilion, twerbillions of word fire, we could inspire higher consciousness and grant our own absolution, both through updated adages and divine locution that blows the mind free of its slavery to the inherent blasphemy that still thunders through the language and now threatens to drag us under toward an ever more miserable yet totally unnecessary destiny. For though so few of us will ever win the lottery, Every one of us could be the conduit for a lot of exotic vocabulary and for catalytic mottos that turn on the world. So that's a little piece from taking command of the English language. It's like, you want good feelings? Oh my gosh, get into a good feeling and then put it out into the world. Mm -hmm. And boy, will that just amplify your frequency. And because destiny and density are the same word, when you enlighten up, then what you share with the world will reverberate and what will come back to you will be a celebration of your innate genius, of your divine umbilical cord, of what flows through you, through plays your heartstrings and resonates with hearts around the world, brings them into a cord, creating high harmonic energies that lift everyone simultaneously. So what else would you wanna be doing with your life? <laughs> we're gonna leave it right there yeah i know i feel like a return to mastering your own life well there you go <laughs> laurel that was mm. so much fun uh -huh. we'll have to do this again somewhere in the future laurel where can people learn more about your work wordmagicglobal.com if you subscribe to my website, you will get my free ebook, which is suitably called The Book of E, a book of alphabet alchemy. And you'll also um, receive occasional emails about the classes that I'm offering, about new podcasts that I've done, like this one with you, which will go on my website. Um, I have a YouTube channel. Um, and I have a Patreon page. And on the Patreon page, um, the for $12, people get access to the private URL for um, Esoterica by Laurel Erica, the definitive exegesis on the letter S in verse, which is an amusing and um, I think significant piece of verse, and also to um, the I that is we. So there's lots of gifts. And so... I have an enormous treasury of word magic and I am in good health and I am 77 years old. I hope to be here long enough to complete the many, many projects that are incomplete. And if people um, care to make a contribution to help liberate my time and also feed my animator in Indonesia, who is responsible for the new YouTube animations um, that I haven't, anyway, please help out. And I have a book called Word Magic Wordplay that puts a new spin on the world. I have maybe three or four copies left of Horsing Around, the inside word on marriage and horses. And I have an enormous array of unpublished books that need your help for to bring it <laughs> into the world. Thank you. And to our friends who are listening and watching, um, it's up to us as far as the, the world that we're going to create and the angelic um, beings that are within us and amongst us um that we want to empower so please do support um the work of people like laurel um other folks that are you know putting out n local newspapers uh, such as our friends at druthers um our platform like whatever platform that speaks to you that you're getting benefit from that you want to see more of within this world it's really important that we support one another um, Laurel we're excited to support your patreon page and um, we encourage all of you to also support uh, her or others around you that you are really loving and 
the messages are resonating with you. It's, it's part of the world that we're co-creating together. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's being really, really conscious of where we spend our money, where we spend our money. So it's how you vote. It's how you vote on yeah. the future that you ultimately want to be a part of. So we love you, Laurel. Laurel we Thank love you, you so much. much. Oh, ditto. Thank and you. We're, we're looking forward to reading, purchasing and reading the children's books that yes. you're going to be publishing soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Much love. So much gratitude. Thank you. That